have a special guest joining us today, uh, Farid Zakaria, host of CNN's GPS show, columnist, author, and someone who is seen as a leading voice on global affairs. Appreciate your joining us, uh, Farid, at a time when the world is watching what's happening play out in Israel. Your first thoughts to reports now coming in that possible airstrikes by the Israeli Air Force in Syria, that's the claim by the Syrians, Israel escalating its offensive in bombarding the Gaza Strip. Are you seeing now a long, drawn-out war that could potentially expand its theater even beyond Gaza? Well, you're pointing to the most troubling uh, of the recent reports, Rajdi. You're absolutely right that this would be an expansion of the war. And what we have to look at is there are two possibilities here. One is that this is an, a, a, an effort by Hamas to disrupt Israel's seeming normalcy, its attempt to create, do a deal with Saudi Arabia, its effort, the Netanyahu government's effort, essentially to ignore the Palestinian issue. And in a kind of brutal, horrific, barbaric way, mm -hmm. Hamas has been trying to uh, change that narrative. But there is another possibility, which is that this is part of a wider uh, war and a wider strategy uh, in which perhaps uh, Hezbollah uh, in the north will get involved. Perhaps Iran is involved in some way or the other. And so what we have to look at is, are, are we seeing Hezbollah uh, firing massive numbers of rockets into Israel. Uh, you know, Hamas fired about 5,000. Hezbollah has 150,000, mm -hmm. uh, many of them guided. What is happening in Syria? I'm not entirely clear as to what has happened there. What was the provocation that caused the Israelis to go in? But those elements, uh, Hezbollah, Syria, Iran, if they come into play, mm -hmm. then what we have is not an Israeli-Palestinian issue, but a broader regional conflict in which Iran and its proxies, uh, Hezbollah, some of the militias uh, in Iraq, the government of Syria are involved. And Israel will then find itself in a more complicated war because it becomes multi-front, multi-playered. And it will not have the, it has had the tacit support of the Gulf Arabs mm -hmm. so far. Mm -hmm. uh, that becomes much more difficult because of the Palestinian issues. So, you're right that this is the greatest complexity we should be looking at right now. We'll, we'll come to, to this widening the possible widening theater of war in a moment. But your sense of what provoked Hamas or what prompted Hamas to do what they did, this kind of bestiality which we are seeing, uh, unprecedented also in the nature of the security and intelligence failure at one level in Israel. Do you see Hamas having, uh, in a way, uh, taken its battle against Israel to another level? And why would they do it, knowing that the Israelis would retaliate with even greater ferocity? So at a, at a purely human level, at a moral level, I think, you know, it's important to point out there's nothing that can justify this kind of action. The, you know, if, if in fact this is true, the beheading and burning of babies, the, the, the slaughter of civilians, taking the hostages uh, who are elderly, disabled, children, none of this, you know, makes any sense to, to, a, to a decent human being. Let us remember, you know, in India that much of the time Mahatma Gandhi would fast. He was fasting because what he was trying to tell Indians, not the British, was do not use violence to achieve your goals, mm -hmm. uh, that it is counterproductive and ultimately morally uh, deeply problematic. So th there's something barbarous and inhuman it's almost worth it's not worth trying to understand the motives there's sometimes evil in the world and the hamas is a is a very brutal barbaric terrorist organization always has been by the way has often killed palestinians in a brutal fashion when it has been battling them mm -hmm. but the the question you ask is what is there a larger strategy here well it appears that hamas was essentially trying to disrupt Israel's, the, the Netanyahu government strategy, which was ignore the Palestinian issue, mm -hmm. divide the Palestinians, uh, keep the Palestinian authority on the defensive by selective encroachments and annexations on the West Bank, keep Hamas quiet by kind of bribing it through uh, Qatari money and, and work visas. And meanwhile, 
try to make a, a peace with the Arabs, normalization with Saudi Arabia, and that that would, in a sense, put Israel in the most secure and advantageous position it had been in decades. What, what Hamas, I think, was reacting to was that strategy and saying, we are going to blow this up. Mm -hmm. Now, why they chose to blow it up in this utterly barbaric, inhuman manner, that, as I say, is, is more about ha Hamas. But I think the strategy, the logic here, was to disrupt and destroy the Netanyahu uh, effort to normalize relations with Saudi Arabia and the broader effort to marginalize and ignore the Palestinian issue. In, in fact, Netanyahu is seen by many Israelis also as partially a villain of the peace because I'm just reading Yuva Hariri in the Washington Post and he seems to suggest that Netanyahu, instead of handling Israel's security situation, had focused instead of grabbing unlimited power for himself and his coalition that is includes messianic zealots and shameless opportunists and many of them were practicing divide and rule politics as you said and were not adhering to any terms of a possible two-state solution do you believe benjamin netanyahu as hariri and others suggest are partly responsible for what has happened they pushed groups like hamas to the wall yeah i think it's again important to, to begin any such analysis by saying the principal culprit here is Hamas, uh, and the you know, and 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 what it did it cannot be viewed as a in any sense justified by whatever Benjamin Netanyahu may have done. That said, I think Harari is on to an important point, which is partly what happened is Bibi Netanyahu was so obsessed with staying in power with the alliance with these right wing extremists in Israel, which meant. This judicial uh, overhaul, essentially ending judici judicial review in Israel, uh, that you know, and and making uh, foreclosing the possibility of a Palestinian state, mm -hmm. that he essentially ignored the possibility that there might be an attack from Gaza. We have fairly good reporting that suggests that members of the military told the Netanyahu government that there was stuff going on in in Gaza. They were doing war planning. They were. They were engaging in military maneuvers in, you know, and Israel has total control over Gaza. It controls the air, land, sea, it blockades it so it could see all this. And apparently the Netanyahu government's response was, these are all Israeli army uh, dissenters. They don't like our government. They're the guys protesting on the street. They're just trying to stop us from doing what we want to do in Israel. Mm -hmm. So there is some evidence that the Netanyahu government was not just ignoring it, but kind of willfully ignoring it because it wanted to pursue the, the, the two issues you, you talked about, judicial uh, overhaul at home and foreclosing the possibility of a Palestinian state in the West Bank. So is, is, that, is it hubris in a way that has driven Israel to ignoring these uh, security uh, threats? And what does this do to the belief of invincibility of the Israeli security of intelligence gathering? To that extent, Israel itself is today a country angry, of course, by what has happened, but possibly a country that suddenly recognizes that its invincibility no longer holds. Very good point, uh, Rajdeep, because Israel really is the military superpower of the region. Uh, it has a military far, far stronger than any of the other militaries in the region. Um, you know, it has nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, most reports suggest 100 nuclear weapons on submarines, which make them largely invulnerable. But you are always challenged in these situations. Uh, and India understands this well. The United States understands this by asymmetrical threats, you know. You, you spend too much time thinking about the big threat. The, you know, it used to be for the Israelis, the Egyptian army, the Syrian army, the Iraqi army, and they can best all those easily. But what they didn't perhaps spend enough time thinking about was this asymmetrical threat, particularly if it took on this brutal and inhuman and barbaric form. Mm -hmm. um, and they were not really, uh, it seems to me, watching Gaza carefully enough and watching that these people were actually engaging in these maneuvers. Mm -hmm. Terrorism is the weapon of the weak. Mm -hmm. uh, it is used by, by people who do not have the possibility to, to defeat you in open warfare. And I think maybe there was an element of hubris where Israel was focused on the battles it can win easily, not on the ones that are much more complicated. But what explains for you Hamas is controlling, uh, you know, control over over the Gaza Strip. There's a belief that Hamas was using this to exercise its dominance in a way uh, over the Palestinian mind, over the Arab street. Do you see Hamas 
as you describe and, and the world has seen as a brutal terrorist force, what explains then its influence in continuing influence or relevance in, uh, in Palestinian hearts and minds? It's a, it's a complicated question and a very good one. So to begin with, Hamas uh, is not that popular in Gaza from everything we can tell. There was only one election. Hamas, even in that election, only won a plurality. It did not win a majority of the vote. Recent public opinion polls that have been taking place suggest major dissatisfaction with, uh, with the rule of uh, Hamas, which is seen as tyrannical and corrupt. I mean, that the numbers are of dissatisfaction are in the 60s and 70 percent range. But what Hamas has been able to do is two things. One, it has, generally speaking, provided reasonably good social services, uh, hospitals and things like that. Mm -hmm. But much more importantly, it has stood in defiance and in opposition to a Palestinian authority, which has been seen as totally corrupt, totally dysfunctional, unable to represent the will of the Palestinians. And in many ways, Hamas has feasted on the dysfunction of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, Abbas, Abu, Abu Mazen, the leader of the Palestinian Authority, is currently in his 16th year or 15th year of his first term uh, as an elected leader. In, in other words, he was elected once and he refused to hold elections after that. It has been 11 years mm -hmm. since his elected term should have expired. Mm -hmm. That itself tells you about the dysfunction of the place. It is deeply corrupt. It does not serve the interests of the Palestinians. And so frustrated Palestinians have uh, sometimes thought of Hamas as a kind of alternative to it. But I don't think there's much evidence that Hamas is popular in Gaza. It rules in Gaza right now through sheer force and tyranny. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in the last couple of days, I've also spoken to leaders from the Palestinian National Congress, uh, 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 Palestinian National Council, and they seem to suggest that while you're focusing on Hamas, what about what has happened to us over the last 25 years? Gaza is an open prison. We've been targeted. Our children have been killed. Why don't you report on that? Do you go along with this Palestinian victimhood argument that is being made almost to, if not justify what Hamas has done, but at least point uh, in the direction of those uh, who claim there's Western hypocrisy that focuses on the deaths that have taken place, tragic in Israel, but not on what's been happening in Gaza, not just now, but over the years. I think you put it correctly. The question is, does it justify uh, what, 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 uh, what Hamas is doing? I don't think it justifies it, but I think it is a fair point to say that people and the Western media and my guess is the Indian media mm -hmm. have ignored some of the legitimate issues that Palestinians have uh, have raised, the legitimate hardships that Palestinians have faced, the fact that there is, in effect, a 56-year occupation, uh, and more broadly that there is, you know, there is, there is no answer to the Palestinian problem being being offered. There are five and a half million Palestinians living between the river and the sea, uh, and they don't have political rights. And this is a huge problem. Now, it is worth it when talking about this, also pointing out that Israel has three times in the last 25 or 30 years offered us, made a serious offer of Palestinian statehood. The most prominent, of course, being Ehud Barak with Bill Clinton, where Clinton spent really the last year of his term as president single-mindedly focused on this, offered a deal to Arafat. Arafat refused to even counter-offer and instead launched the second intifad. That, the, a, a version of that deal was then offered again to Abu Mazen by Ehud Omer. Mm -hmm. Barak was a left-wing uh, Israeli politician. Omer was a right-wing Israeli politician. So, and, and again, no, no, no response, no counter-offer. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, if, if when you think about Palestinian victimhood and such, you have to put some blame on Palestinian leaders. Look, you may have a just cause in the world, but you have to have strength and good leadership mm -hmm. to be able to uh, achieve those goals. India had a good cause uh, in searching for independence, but it was blessed by having extraordinarily powerful, shrewd leaders who unified India, presented a you know, single set of demands to the British, were mm -hmm. disciplined about how they acted. As I say, Gandhi decided on a strategy of nonviolence and rigidly adhered to it to the point where 
He would discipline people who refused to do it. You see none of that on the Palestinian side. So you can't be too surprised, sadly, mm -hmm. that if people with a just and legitimate grievance are very badly led by corrupt and feckless and dysfunctional leadership, I that the cause doesn't, doesn't prosper. You know, it's interesting you mentioned Arafat and Clinton because it was famously said of Arafat, he's never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. But we are now in 2023, very different leadership. Uh, even in the United States, there's a sense that the United States also hasn't invested enough anymore in a, in a solution, in a two-state solution that most observers believe is the only way out, Israel and Palestine living, uh, coexisting peacefully. The Biden administration hasn't done enough, and now suddenly it's sending its entire forces into Israel and saying we are standing by your shoulder. To what extent, what is America's role going to now be, and did America take its eye off the ball? So the, 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 the biggest difficulty in the strategy in, in what you're describing is that the Netanyahu government is absolutely determined that there be no two-state two solution. It has members of senior members of the cabinet who believe that the right strategy for Israel is to annex everything, all, all of the West Bank, all of Gaza, create a greater Israel from the river to the sea. I don't know what they plan to do with the five and a half million Palestinians living there, but the real obstacle here is the Netanyahu government. Mm -hmm. But I think you make an interesting point, uh, Rajdeep, and, it, and I'd say the broader strategic context in which all this has happened has been the withdrawal of American power from the Middle East. The United States was the primus inter pares. It was the dominating force in the Middle East. It had better relations with most countries in the Middle East than they had with each other. Mm -hmm. And ever since the, the Iraq war, America has been withdrawing its military, its political, its diplomatic footprint, focusing instead on Asia, focusing, of course, very, very significantly on India. But what, is, what has ever been created is a kind of post-American Middle East. Mm -hmm. And into that vacuum, what has happened is you have had a series of actors trying to assert their, their influence, trying to take advantage. Iran, which was the principal beneficiary of the Iraq war, which now has militias in Iraq, mil uh, the government of Syria, militias uh, and, the, and the Houthis in Yemen, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, reasonably friendly relations with Qatar. But then you have Saudi Arabia trying to flex its muscles and become the most powerful country in the Middle East because it is the richest country in the Middle East. You have Turkey that has decided it needs to protect its equities. And of course, you have Israel. But you have a lot of malign forces as well, Hezbollah, Hamas, the militias. So what has happened is the, uh, the withdrawal of American power has created a vacuum into which all kinds of forces have filled. And I would say the lesson for the United States is, you know, be careful about withdrawing it diplomatically and politically. It's understandable not wanting to give, be involved militarily. So but I, for the rest of the world, I think that there's a larger issue, which is people love to yell and scream about American hegemony. Mm -hmm. We are now seeing what the world would look like in the absence of American hegemony. You know, that's fascinating the way you've just put it, because there are those now who believe that there could be a battle in West Asia, Middle East, between the more uh, uh, conservative forces or the more radicalized Islamic forces and those who are more moderate. Uh, Saudi Arabia trying to moderate itself, reach out even to Israel, while you've got Iran on the other hand trying to emerge as the sort of leader of the Islamic world. Do you see that therefore making this region now even more explosive, where we started off, the possibility that the theater of war could expand into some of those countries like Syria, like Lebanon, like even possibly Iran. Is that the real danger? And can Iran, uh, can Israel and America risk that? There is a distinct danger of that. Look, the, there, is a, there is a battle taking place in the world between the forces of order and the forces of disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russias of the world, the Irans of the world, the Hezbollahs, the Hamas. Uh, these are forces that want to erode uh, and, and destroy the international system because they believe it is too Western dominated, too American dominated. And if the forces of order do not come together and unify and act in with some degree of cooperation and, and concert, mm -hmm. there is a danger because, the, you know, the forces of order, it's much easier to create chaos mm -hmm. than it is to impose order. It is much easier to be the spoiler. Uh, it is much easier to be the disruptor than to be the institution builder. Uh, India faces this challenge, obviously, on its border with, 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 with militants as well. 
And India should realize this is one of the areas where I think India needs to understand its broader strategic objectives are entirely aligned with the United States and with, with Europe, with Japan, with Australia, which is mm -hmm. India wants a world of order. It wants an open international system, a, a, a rule-based international system. It does not want a world in which Hezbollah is emboldened, Hamas is emboldened. And if Hamas seems to, quote-unquote, win this, and you know that's a complicated issue, but it will embolden Hezbollah, it will embolden the Houthis, uh, it will embolden possibly militants in West Asia, in, in South Asia as well. You know, the, the, there is a, nothing succeeds in life like success. And it, it's important that, this, that the forces of order mm -hmm. make an effort to ensure that we do not go down the kind of downward spiral you were suggesting. So what, what, according to you, therefore, should be India's response? India's response so far has been to say that we stand with Israel. Uh, it has been that, we, yes, we are identifying over the years with the Palestinian struggle. But at the moment, we stand with Israel, a country that has been hit by terror. Do you believe that's the right approach? Because over the years, there was a sense in an earlier period that we always espoused the Palestinian cause above all else. It took a while for us to actually make this reach out to Israel. Should we see Israel as our ally in this battle, even though that could cost us possible friendships in, the, uh, in West Asia and Middle East? I, I think broadly speaking, the Indian response has been correct, which is to strike a balance between very strongly being against terror, sympathizing with Israel as having gone through this horrible terror attack, and yet reminding people that India supports the Palestinian cause, supports the idea of a Palestinian state. That seems to me the rational position uh, for India. Look, on this particular issue, I don't think India has any particular you know, need to get more deeply involved. But on the broader issue of where it stands in the world, mm -hmm. you know, with, with the forces of order, United States, Western Europe, Japan, uh, or does it, does it stand with the world of disorder? you know, Russia, Iran, and that, that's where I think it has to make some bigger and broader strategic decisions. Uh, and there is there is still a tendency in, in India to want to, uh, to, to honestly, to sit on the fence and, mm -hmm. to, and to wobble and to claim that this is some great multi-aligned policy. Well, I don't believe in being multi-aligned between forces of order and disorder, between forces of, of terror and forces of... Uh, of institution building. As you said, there are, you know, this is a battle in a way between force of order and disorder. Are there winners and losers then in this battle, given what we've seen in the last 48 hours, Gaza being pounded, now we've got a blockade involving fuel supplies being denied. Israel says unless hostages are returned, we will continue with this blockade. There is a potential humanitarian crisis out there. Will there be any winners or losers in this battle in your view? Well, the biggest losers are the Palestinian people uh, who have been badly served by their leadership and are now being, uh, uh, you know, frankly, badly served by the Israeli response, which seems to be uh, inevitably uh, re resulting in collateral damage because Gaza is the most densely populated part of the world. Mm -hmm. Any Israeli military action is going to have that effect. Um, so I think that they are the, the losers. Look, the, 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 there is a there is a a strategy out of here which ensures that uh, Hamas does not win. What is Hamas trying to do? Hamas is trying to do two things. One, to bait Israel into a massive military counter counteroffensive, a massive military overreaction that then uh, kills lots of Palestinian civilians, uh, produces enormous amounts of Arab sympathy for Palestinians, and as a result, scuttles any prospect of any normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia, maybe even breaks off the ties between Israel uh, and uh, the UAE and uh, the other countries that have uh, normalized relations. So Israel's goal should be that its response should be geared to denying Hamas that victory, which means don't overdo the, 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 the counteroffensive, don't overdo collateral damage, be careful, and most importantly, try to restart the, the, the negotiations with Saudi Arabia. That is still the strategic prize for Israel. If they achieve that, mm -hmm. they will have frankly thwarted uh, what Hamas is trying to do. But in order to achieve that, they have to be careful not to inflame the Arab street, not to create uh, you know, thousands and thousands of Palestinian casualties. So that's the way I would approach it, which is keep your eye on the prize. 
The, the prize is Israel normalizing relations with the Gulf Arabs, which would be a very significant move uh, forward to create a more stable and peaceful and orderly Middle East. Because but, you would take this long-standing mm -hmm. conflict and diffuse it. But, but, but isn't that, that isn't that really isn't that smart? Sorry, isn't that Farid pushing it? Uh, uh, isn't that now pushed to the distance because now Netanyahu desperately needs to restore his political authority and credibility within a country, an angry country, an outraged country that wants revenge. It's a bit like, dare I say, you know, people have likened what's happened to 9-11. Others in India have likened it to 26-11. Do you go along with those parallels or do you believe what's happened is completely unique and different? Well, the lesson of 9-11, I think, is that we massively overreacted in the long run. In the short run, I think we, we acted appropriately, but the United States massively overreacted and militarized its response, particularly in the Middle East. Bismarck once said, uh, fools learn from their own mistakes, wise men learn from other people's mistakes. It would seem to me that the Israelis should learn from the American mistakes after 9-11, as I say, it's hard for Netanyahu. I agree with you politically, but this is what you get paid to do as a statesman. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a statesman, you have to thread those needles. And there is a way, it seems to me, to uh, to respond appropriately and 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 punishingly. I think, for example, it might be it might be a, a, a wise strategy to take a, a you know a half kilometer strip around the around Gaza and create a buffer zone between Israel and Gaza, so that something like this becomes much more difficult in the, past, in, the, in the future. Those are the kind of actions that will actually build deterrence for the future. But just violence for the sake of vengeance, first of all, is counterproductive, but most importantly, it will destroy the very goal that Israel was, achieve, it was trying to achieve, which is why Hamas was reacting. It will hand Hamas a victory. Mm -hmm. If Israel reacts in such a way that the Gulf Arab states say any normalization is off the table. UAE has to break off relations. Bahrain has to break off relations. What will Israel have achieved other than to hand Hamas the long-term victory? But do you see the United States uh, uh, counseling uh, uh, Netanyahu in exactly the way you have? Netanyahu is setting up a uni unity government. He seems to be calling for vengeance. But do you see the Americans? Blinken is there. Biden uh, hopefully will speak to Netanyahu. And convince him that you cannot have disproportionate response that will virtually engulf the entire region in this uh, permanent blood curdling uh, battle of uh, of violence i'm sure that's what the american uh, the biden administration believes i'm sure that that is what they will privately and very privately counsel i am not confident that it will have much effect remember this is an administration that has had very bad relations with the netanyahu government Biden was openly critical of Netanyahu's efforts to end judicial review uh, in, in Israel, a rare case of an American president taking sides on a domestic Israeli issue. Uh, the Biden administration has been pushing them to take the Palestinian issue more, more seriously. And Netanyahu has openly sided with Republicans for the last 10 years. A uh, very strange uh, a decision, but if you remember, he openly campaigned against Obama on the Iran nuclear deal, openly uh, embraced Trump even when he was a candidate. So th this, there's no love lost between the Biden administration and Netanyahu. So I, I don't know how effective any such uh, advice will be. My, my final question, therefore, Farid, is last year it was Ukraine. In 2023, it is West Asia erupting again. Is the world becoming more disorderly, to use your word? Is the world becoming more chaotic uh, and, and, and with, with fresh friction points emerging? And is the battle of the future between those states and those countries committed to a more orderly, just society and those that are uh, increasingly caught up in, in, in expansionism, in terror, in radicalism? Yes, I think that this is the great challenge we face now, the forces of order and the forces of disorder. And it's important to point out that while the forces of disorder can make a lot of noise, cause a lot of bloodshed, cause a lot of problems, they are fundamentally weak. They, these are the losers in, the, in, this, in, this, uh, in this world that is emerging of greater openness, greater, you know, greater economic strength and vitality, broader options and and uh, and wealth for the middle classes 
look at the the world of order like you know it's the united states it's europe it's uh japan uh, south korea australia singapore i would put india into that category that's 70 70 percent of world gdp that's 85 percent of world military spending or maybe 80 percent uh, you know uh, china sits i think somewhere in the middle unsure of where it wants to be russia is in open opposition iran is but it's a handful of countries a handful of groups so the key is can the world of order stay united can it mm -hmm. cooperate can it uh try reckon you know be, can it be wise can mm -hmm. it pursue a long long range policy if it can these are you know this is what i used to say after 9 11 these are a ragtag bunch of of people mm -hmm. as long as you don't uh, react foolishly uh, ultimately history is not on uh, history is not on hamas's side you know, you're saying history is not on Hamas's side, but there will be people in this in this country and across the world who see those images, see the cruelty, the barbarism, and will say, and have already said, Hamas equals terror, equals Islamic radicalism, and thereby an entire religion gets demonized. Is that also a concern? Uh, uh, almost a civilizational battle. I've had Israeli guests on this show saying this is a battle between civilized states and barbarians. Yeah, this is this is you know we've confronted this issue ever since 9/11, and you know what, any intelligent person can see that when you're talking about a civilization, even if such a thing exists as Islam, uh, you're of 1.7 billion people, mm -hmm. you're talking about a few thousand people in in Hamas doing what they did. As I say, they've often killed uh, Palestinians. Much of Muslim terror, if you want to call it Muslim terror, has been directed at other Muslims. So how is it Islam right. against the rest? ISIS killed mostly Muslims. Uh, Al-Qaeda killed mostly Muslims. The Shia militias killed mostly Muslims. These are internal battles within Islam. But again, they're the forces of modernization and the forces of moderation are so much more powerful than these ragtag bunches of radicals. The largest Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. The, the second, you know, the the, the second, third, fourth largest countries are basically all the populations of, uh, of South, South Asia, Asia, India, Bangladesh. Where do you see uh, uh, anti-Western terrorism there? I mean, I think, you know, George uh, W. Bush used to uh, proudly boast that he looked at India and he found that this was a Muslim population that did not have a single member of Al-Qaeda. I, I think people forget the breadth and diversity and richness of the Islamic world and when they focus on these one or two places, you know, it would be like looking at one Christian right wing neo-nationalist movement in the United States and saying all Christians are one way or the other. I think any intelligent analysis would understand that these are people who are in many ways mm -hmm. using and misusing religion to achieve very, very specific goals that they have, which are often the personal and institutional power for their group. Because, you know, in, to, because in this country, there are always going to be people be, who want to say it's all about it's all about uh, uh, religion. But, you know, what can I say? They're wrong. Because in this country, we've suffered uh, with cross-border terrorism from Pakistan groups like the Lashkar. So in a sense, that gets magnified, this sense of anger and this belief that, look, we've got to identify with Israelis today who are also victims of similar cross-border terrorism carried by groups that you know, uh, will chant, uh, we will use Islamic chants to almost justify and rationalize that violence. But as you're saying, these are, you don't, you believe that these are ragtag groups that eventually will be defeated by the forces of order and moderation. Am I clear though? Am I right? Absolutely. And most importantly, by the forces of order and moderation within Muslim societies. The truth of the matter is most of these people, these groups get discredited and get defeated because the vast majority of Muslims don't want it. After all, why do these guys use terrorism? Because they can't win a vote anywhere. If they, if if the if you know if you could get if if uh, ISIS were able to, uh, to 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 rule Syria through democratic elections, it wouldn't be trying to dis dislodge the government vi violently. The, the, the important thing to realize is the logic of violence and terror is being used by these groups precisely because they know that the vast majority of people don't agree with them. They have to they have to achieve their goals using shock, horror, violence, mm -hmm. because they can't do it through elections, ballots, free, you know, uh, making their arguments. 
Muslims the world over have rejected that. You know, they look at the, the, the Arab world. Every Muslim's dream in the Arab world is to go to Dubai, <laughs> right? Nobody wants to go to, uh, to ISIS headquarters. Nobody wants to go to Gaza. The, the, these people are a, a tiny, unpopular minority that use violence against Muslims most of the time to get their way. I think Indians understand this because there is a large Muslim population in India that has lived you know, peacefully uh, and amicably. You can always, um, leaders can always manipulate religious and regional and sectarian differences for, for their ends. But the reality remains, you know, that, that uh, Muslims have been in India for a very long time, a thousand years. Um, and I think most Indians actually inside recognize that uh, the truth of the matter is that this is you're talking about my, a minority of a minority, not a majority of, of, of so, the so, 1.7. So if I, it was the majority of 1.7 billion people in the world, we would have a lot of problems right now. So, so in conclusion, Farid, your best case and worst case scenario, what's the best case scenario? A short, swift uh, 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 offensive? Or is the worst case scenario uh, a war whose theater spreads by the week? Yeah, I think you put it exactly right. Short, swift, uh, maybe establish that, that uh, buffer zone I was describing. Uh, take some other actions that, you know, that ensure that uh, Hamas's military infrastructure is uh, decapitated. Talk to Qatar to make sure that, uh, the, you know, the money flows uh, are cut off. But most importantly, think about what would, what would make this a defeat for Hamas. And that would be do something serious on the Palestinian issue so that you can get these, the, the uh, Saudi Arabia talks going again, mm -hmm. get the Arab states comfortable with the idea of an Israeli Arab rapprochement, which, you know, and so that you'd have a win win. It would be a win for the Palestinians because they would get something. You'd have a win for Israel. You'd have a win for the Arabs. And by the way, you would have a win for overall stability. You know, I, in a way, Farid, talking to you has been educative over the last 30 minutes. I greatly appreciate you taking the time of giving our Indian viewers a global perspective. Uh, I keep saying this Farid and I went to the same school. It means that you can go to the same school, but not necessarily uh, be able to go as far in life as you have. So always uh, good to listen to you, Farid. And I hope that someone out there is listening to these voices of sanity amidst the insanity that we see around us. Thank you very much, Farid Zakaria, for joining me there uh, from New York. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajdeep.